Um, I'm going to start with an apology because I have a very bad cough and cold. So if you don't hear me, put your hand down. And if you still can't hear me, then I'll get Karen who's presenting the second half to start much earlier. <laughs> okay, so a quick, quick introduction in terms of what we're going to cover today. It's the title is a bit ambiguous, but really what we're saying is how do you actually take e-learning to that next step of making it work? So we know we've delivered e-learning and other forms of e-learning. This is how do you actually make it work or make sure that what you have delivered is working. So that's kind of a nutshell, but I'll, I'll crack on. Um, quickly, this is who we are. We're essentially a bespoke uh, development company. Uh, we've been in business over the last 20 odd years, um, run by training professionals, so this is what we do. Um, we've won a fair bit of awards for the work we've done. So again, that's really what we do. We cover off the bespoke e-learning part of it. There's obviously as part of that you deliver mobile, um, the LMS, we also do generic. But that's just to give you a background of who we are and what we do. Okay, so I guess the first question is, what have you actually learned to do? Because we all learn a lot of things. That doesn't necessarily mean we know how to do them. And that's one of the fundamentals of what we're going to be talking about today. So for us, what's important is the actual learning actually happens when you can be sure that the people, your learners can actually show that they've learned how to apply the knowledge that you've given them. And that's the whole pre <coughs> premise for what we're talking about today. So it's about shows, there's evidence, there's application of the knowledge that they've been given. And I think this sums it up very well. Because you can teach someone and they've learned it. But like he says, he learned it, I didn't say he could do it. And that's, I think, a lot of what we encounter in our world is a lot of knowledge is going out there but we don't ever really know how people are actually taking that and using it you can give all the instructions in the world eventually the learner will do it their way so the, the whole thing is about perspective so it's about learners looking at things and saying this is what it means to me, this is how I'm going to use this, this is why I need to do this. And this is one of the things <laughs> from a learning design perspective, perspective again, is something that we don't often look at. So there's a delivery element of, and there's an acquisition element of knowledge. And sometimes the two aren't aligned. And again, it depends who you are, where you're approaching it from, but it could mean the same thing could mean three different things. So I'm just going to cover off briefly, and this is very generic, this is very uh, global, but these are the things we actually face. We've got information overload, we've got so much happening, so much being thrown at us on an every, everyday basis. We've got the hassle of compliance. Whether it's internal, whether it's driven by law, whether it's you know, process, system, all of this is something we need to do every single day. So the burden of compliance, the complexity of compliance <clears throat> makes and sometimes subsumes the actual learning. We've got multiple channels. You know? We've got so much being thrown at us, so much happening in the world, so much change and the rapidity of it it's sometimes very difficult to actually keep up with what you started out to do. <coughs> I'm terrible at this. I start here and end up somewhere there because something else has popped up. <coughs> Having been given all that knowledge, can we actually remember it when we need to apply it? So it's the context of what we are doing and the knowledge that we need to use at that point of time, which is the important thing. So what does our learning actually deliver? <clears throat> Today we're delivering knowledge, we're delivering information, we're delivering reference, 
but that doesn't necessarily translate into a skill. It doesn't necessarily translate into the ability to do. It's all of that stuff, and it's all good stuff. I think there's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> but what we actually are delivering is availability, accessibility, cost efficiencies, and savings in time. That's the underpinning of everything that we do. While we're delivering that, the one piece we're missing out is the to-do or the skill piece. <coughs> Again, very familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of us. This is where we need to start focusing. <clears throat> you have a problem, there's a training intervention. It could be e-learning, it could be anything. But there's an intervention. But after that, we tend to leave the learner on their own. Now, you've learned this. We've given you the knowledge. You go and find somewhere to apply it. You apply it in the right context. That doesn't always happen because that's not always something that we've actually equipped them to do. So we're going to talk about this in this, this area. <clears throat> I'm sure some of you, all of you are familiar with this. That the ability to retain knowledge drops off very quickly. In the first 24 hours, <clears throat> you will tend to lose more than 50% of what you've learned. You walk out of a course, it all seems wonderful. Yes, we remember it. I know where I'm going to use this. And the next day, you're back at your desk. Life takes over. You know, so that drops off radically over a period of time. This is one way or the theory of how do we actually tackle this. So while your forgetting curve is dropping off steeply, these interventions or reviews or, or reinforcement of the learning <clears throat> tends to lift that forgetting curve every so often. But what are these interventions? What do we need to do at that point is very important. And again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is something that we're all considering. It's something that we're all doing. This is the model we're all following. 95% of our learning still comes from the formal side. What we're going to do is actually focus <clears throat> on this part of peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning through other people, not necessarily through any other intervention, but learning through other people. And again, just to reinforce 50% of our memory is lost in the first 24 hours. So this is where we'd like to be. We'd like to take the training wheels off the bike. We want our people to be able to cycle and manage themselves, implement, learn, and apply the learning. We want them to be able to <clears throat> understand. A lot of what we do is in that area. <clears throat> so we're testing knowledge. We're testing their ability to remember. <clears throat> not their ability to do. And this is where we believe we have an initiative that we're bringing to the table that will help us to be able to do this. All the, the earlier part is good. All the knowledge acquisition, all of that is very good. But it's that final push of, I know where to use it, I know how to use it, and I know in what context to use it. So... <clears throat> I'm going to phone a friend and introduce you to Karen Brook, who's going to take over from here. And I happily have gone through that without coughing and spluttering. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you. So when um, Alan approached us and said, you know, he's working now at Walk Grove, we've known Alan a long time. And myself and my colleagues got very excited because of course what we're passionate about in coaching on call is about integrating with organizations whether that that are interested in blended learning and really helping that learning transfer to happen and the way we see it is very much that we have the bat we hold the baton all the time 
and passing it one to another so that there's seamless ways of ensuring that the learning, the information that Alan was just talking about is put into practice within the organisation so that people really feel confident and competent to be able to put in that knowledge that they have just learned. What our experience um, tells us is that often it's about some of the, the traditional paradigms that they might be working in, the culture that they're working in, the confidence of doing something a different way that prevents them, even though they might contextualize what they've learned and they've got the concepts to actually make that happen can be quite difficult for a lot of people and that's where we step in and we we are a coaching organization we specialize in coaching and so therefore obviously learning and, and personal development is what we do we d want things to be very practical tactical we want things to be as simple as possible but no simpler and that's the, the philosophy in which we um, work so we know through a lot of research, and you will all know, because I guess you're all in learning and development, that there's lots of research that show, it, that show things about how different learning happens when you follow up either training or e-learning with coaching. It ends up being very different. And also, we now know, because of neuroscience, and I'm noticing that there's neuroscience everywhere at the moment, and, and it's great for us as learning and development people because it is proving what we always thought all along to be right, that you need to have practice, you need to actually do it almost immediately in the right context in order that you do change and you do things differently. So it has to be repetition, you need to change those neural networks. So all these things and all these pieces of um, research that's been done, and often in a sales arena, because that's the way you can really measure the pounds, shillings and pence, as it were. Sorry, I'm showing my age there. Uh, pounds and pence. Um, whereas, the, obviously, other ways of measuring it is through your 360s and, and whatever methodology you use in your organisation. But there's no doubt, there's like 60% and upwards of learning that's transferred into the workplace after they've had coaching, after the information giving. So it has to be worth doing. And I think when it really does work is when the, the whole design of a program has it all fully integrated. So when it's worked for us, at its best, this is the sort of thing that people have been saying, and I'm not kidding you. The first time I did a, a really good piece of blended learning with an organization, where we were in it right at the beginning, so we were part of the whole design, somebody came up to us without even uh, soliciting it and said this to us, that it, they knew that they had learned far more and put more in practice through that over a period of time and having the coaching to help them to think about how to put it into practice, having touch points with their peers and doing some peer learning as well as some e-learning as well. And they, they said they've never had learning like that and been able to use it in the way that they have had, even though it was a similar kind of topic to what they'd learned before. So some case studies, just to give you an idea of where we have done it. The, one of the first um, companies we worked with was DSGI, where we were part of their EDP program, their executive development program. And again, that was a fully blended, integrated service. And that was, we, because we are scalable and uh, we have all different languages, it meant that wherever they were in the world, we could provide that backup so that everything they'd learned at that time, it, the Ash, it was Ashridge that we were working with and webinars. We were able to help them then to think it through in their own cultures, in their own language and in their own workplace. Celgene, that's another one where it worked well with the leadership program. We were fully integrated there. We had some fabulous feedback from that too. And I'll get, later on, there'll be some quotes from these people and the sorts of things that they did learn and how they benefited from it. Morgan Advanced Materials, another one, global um, learning there where we're again helping that transfer of learning highly successfully. Now, the one at uh, Kantar, we... we 
we work with them and we've got hundreds of their managers who have their on-demand service so any time they want they can call up and have expert coaching for a very quick practical tactical 30-minute call to help them to do their best work give them their comp confidence and competence they, it was a successful program, so they decided that they would also align it then with their, some of their other training. But because it was sort of an adjunct onto it, rather than it being designed into that program, it has turned out not to be as successful. So it really does back up that it needs to be part of the design process as well. So it really is seen as a seamless, integrated thing for the learners' point of view and the people on these training programs or doing their e-learn. So that's really just saying it is inter integrated. So what is the process? It's really simple. As I said, one of our philosophies is that we want it to be simple. We want people to be able to use it. And so imagine that you're doing an e-learn or your people are there and they're learning all about something to do maybe with health and safety or engineering or leadership or whatever it might be. And they come to a certain point where they've learned about some model or some theory and before they go to the next one, there's a button saying, now talk this through as to how, what, what meaning you make of that. How can, what does that mean in your context? And they can then talk to somebody to really get underneath what it is that that theory means and how they can put it into practice. So they click online and then they say it's a very personal very personal service then. It's, it's a real person rather than a, a computer that they're speaking to. Why does it work? Because we know that learning will only take place if there's some benefit and if it is actually in my context. Because if it's in somebody else's context or it's just some generalization, we won't learn it, we won't remember it because we need it to have some meaning, we need to have some emotional impulse that, and that's what makes it stick rather than going in here and out there. With the coaching, what we can do is make sure that we're addressing real personal needs. So we can hone in on what is that specific belief that somebody may have that might be preventing them from actually putting this into practice. Or it can be, I have a certain learning style and therefore the coach, because they're expert coaches, can get underneath that and make sure that they're addressing that. Now that's what training programs, they can do some of that for sure, if it's face-to-face -face training programs, but e-learn, it's, it's really one or two mediums. Whereas this is very, very personal. Why is somebody external? Because I think the manager, the line managers are also going to be quite important in all of this because th th there has to be all everybody involved um, to make it work at its very best. But one of the reasons why an external person is useful is because there is that confidentiality. If I'm really struggling with something, I can admit it to somebody because they don't have any agenda. It's not my manager. So that certainly is it. Also, I know that, that even when managers are really interested and into whatever the topic is that the individual is be it's learning quite often they're so busy themselves it just doesn't happen and certainly again all the research that we we've um, found is backing that up uh, so even though the will may be there the actual time might not be so availability is there there's no bias and I think the biggest thing is that we are able to build that uh, back to that confidence and I keep repeating that because I think that is one of the main key things that we can do it's to shift beliefs in a way that makes them confident and therefore change it actually happens. So th just to give you some examples of um, some of the feedback that we've got, this is verbatim feedback. One of the things that um, people are surprised about is how short a time it can take to have it, particularly because usually it will be over the telephone, can be Skype, that's optional. They can use the same coach if they wish, that is also optional, or they can just have a different coach if they wish. So again, this is dependent on how it's set up. 
but everybody comes back and says they're absolutely amazed at what a difference it makes. So that was the a leadership course. Works equally as well for compliance. And then this has just happened to be a managing meetings course that we also were part of. So I think in one way it's almost a no-brainer to with everything that we know about how the brain works, everything we know about the research of coaching following training and the difficulty that there is sometimes in transferring knowledge into action. We hope that you'll come and visit us and talk to us more because I think it's a marriage made in heaven, this Ela, Alan and I, not, not literally obviously, <laughs> um, uh, to make things work for you and really get behavioural change happening in, a, in the most efficient and cost efficient way because I think that's the important message here too. So if you have any questions, please, the floor is yours. No? Oh. So N9 or T9? T9 is coaching on call. N9, Walk Grove. Do you want to? Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time.